One thing that might not be intuitive to deduction, but nevertheless is of utmost importance to the field of deduction, is adaptation. So, before we get into the topic for today, I would like to draw attention to my new shirt, the Writer, Actor, Director, YouTuber shirt. Now, you can't get this shirt, unfortunately, they, they're all out, it was kind of limited edition sort of thing, but um, it's kind of a funny story how I came across this. So, I was browsing my YouTube subscription feed and noticed that one of my favorite YouTubers, Matthias, had uploaded a new video. So, I clicked on it, and towards the end, he talked about this new shirt that he had made. Although he doesn't really make a lot of merch, uh, he made this shirt. So, then I thought to myself, you know what? I'm a YouTuber. That sounds like a good shirt for me. So, um,. I was like, okay, since the offer's for a limited time only, I might as well get to that. So I purchased one of these shirts, and uh, that was a few weeks ago, and it just came in the mail the other day, since they had to print them and everything after the offer was over, so that they uh, had just printed in uh, as many that were bought. So, uh, either way, it's an awesome shirt, and I love it, and... Um, so shout out to Matthias, he's actually, he's one of my favorite YouTubers in terms of comedy, and uh, he's actually the, uh, the one who inspired me to do comedy sketches on my channel, so go and check him out, support him, and let him know that I sent you. So be it in deduction, observation, mindfulness, mentalism, what have you, adaptation is, can be what sets you apart from other deductions. So adaptation pretty much has three general um, ap uh, applications to deduction. There's the first and most obvious one, and the one that we've talked about on this channel quite a bit, and that is the adaptation to new environments. Pretty much observation in a nutshell, and I've talked about observation for so many videos. But the general idea is that when you enter a new environment and you consciously map it out, you understand the placement of things, your own position in space compared to other other um, things in, in the environment. You also have the different people in the environment and they are technically part of your environment so you adapt to the interactions with people which is something that we haven't really talked about yet but we, we can talk about in a future episode actually. Um, We'll talk about different methods and things that you can do, but we'll get to that in a little bit. So, um, that's pretty much adaptation to environments. I'm not going to dwell on that too long because I've talked about that a lot in the past. So, moving on to the next application of adaptation. The adaptation of your theories to new information. Many times, we like to get comfortable in the theories and deductions that we make. Uh, so we can, you know, go in and make a deduction about a particular person or a particular object or place or something of that nature, and then have a develop a pretty solid theory based on the observations that we've made about what it, whatever it is we're deducing about, and come across a theory that is that we are very comfortable with and actually quite proud of, and you know that feeling of accomplishment is not bad at all, unless it gets in the way of further deduction. Now, sometimes when we've made a theory, and sometimes even when we've made a full deduction, and then new observation comes in that challenges that deduction or that theory. Now, many times one might be inclined to simply disregard that information or try and fit the puzzle piece where it doesn't really belong in that uh, whole deduction and kind of rationalize and, and you know justify why it fits into the theory that we've made because we've put so much time and effort into that. This is not something that we want to do and uh, is really a flaw in the whole logical process. What we want to do is adapt our theories to that information because our theories and deductions are not going to be 100% accurate. That's just a fact. You can pretty much get it to a 70 to 85% accuracy, in my opinion. Um, and that takes a lot of practice and a lot of training. 
and depending how on how broad the deduction is in general if it's more broad the more chances of you being right the more precise the more chances of you being wrong so you can make the deduction hey that person has eaten something in the last 12 hours you're probably right now can you say they had a steak dinner last night that has more of a chance of being wrong uh, but anyway that's a topic for another video so basically the adaptation of your theories and deductions to new information that comes in is paramount. You cannot get off track with the truth when it comes to your theories. Now, just like with opinions and biases that get in our way of making deductions, we, our theories tend to do the same thing because we develop a sort of bias towards them because of all the effort that we've put into them. So we have to treat them like any other um, opinion or bias if new information comes that challenges that dedu that deduction or theory. So we just have to treat it as as it is. It's fallible. Now the truth, the facts, the observations, those aren't really. So uh, only our interpretation of those facts can be fallible because they are right there. And let I cannot stress that enough. I cannot stress being open-minded when it comes to your own theories uh, to new information that comes in. It is of paramount importance and cannot be overlooked to any self-respecting deductionist or deductionist to be. So the next thing that we have in my notes here is the adaptation of your mindset to new situations. Now, this is a very interesting thing to think about. Now, when it comes to new situations that, that come up, this can be in a multitude of ways. Environments can change, people can change, situations themselves in general can change. Uh, a person's social standing can change. Any, Pretty much anything and everything in society is subject to some sort of change and should be treated as such. Now, what can separate you from other people is anticipation of that change. Now, most people, it's pretty much a running joke of uh, amongst many writers and philosophers that humans, we don't really like change, and I would agree with that. We, we don't really like change as in general because it can question. It can cause us to question. It can challenge us. It can, um, it can endanger us. We know what is safe, and we like to stick with it. It makes sense. Now, when it comes to an ever-changing world and ever-changing society, it, the only logical thing that you can really assume is that things are going to keep changing, whether minutely or drastically. Now, when it comes to adapting to those situations if you're anticipating changing in uh, changes in situation then you're going to be more able to adapt to those now this leads into um, more of a focused view on this topic when it comes to deductions that you make one method might work well for one person or for one object or for one room or something of that nature however Techniques and methods don't always work this, uh, the same way with, with you know, different things that you're observing. So one person, you might be able to go at it in a systematic approach with different questions uh, in mind um, and make a good deduction about them. Now you try and ask those same questions and apply those same methods to another person and you find that it just doesn't work. What's the difference? They're, still, they're both people. Uh, the difference is that people are generally different and one method one size doesn't fit all so adaptation to new situations new people new places all that is really paramount to making good deduction so going back to Sherlock Holmes again he does get surprised about things mainly in his inability to be able to anticipate new information coming up if new information comes up about a case that is you know groundbreaking or shaking to uh, theories and deductions that have been made um, he's he does get surprised about that 
but not in the same way you and I would get, you or I would get surprised about something or how a normal person would get surprised about something. Most people when they get surprised usually react like this. Now, in terms of body language and facial expressions, surprise is an emotion that lasts only about two seconds, give or take. Observe if you're watching this, correct me in the comments if I'm wrong. Now, um, when it comes to the surprise that Sherlock Holmes uh, encounters when confronted with new information, he is not he is surprised, but he isn't taken aback. He is surprised his inability to be able to anticipate new this new information coming, but he is not he's not caught off guard in the fact that new information has come up. This allows him to quickly assess the new information compared to the old information and the theories and deductions that he's already made and form a general game plan in, in his chair as he's listening to this new information come in so that he can continue with the investigation. No time will be lost, no ground will be lost, and he can cover what uh, he can catch up whatever ground he has lost. So he he will get uh, angry at himself and uh, reflect on his mistakes and why he wasn't able to anticipate or observe that information and why uh, and all and all that. But that will happen after the case is solved. Before the case is solved, he's not really worried about that. He's not focused on that. He's he just needs to solve the case. And this new information, however um, surprising it is that it came up for whatever reason. He will solve the case before addressing the reasons why he was not able to anticipate that. And, and sometimes when he does make those mistakes in the books, he'll talk to Watson later after the case is solved, case is closed, and he'll be like, Watson, here's where I messed up. And, um, you know, he's even had, he's even told Watson to tell him when he's making these mistakes again so that he, so that he doesn't get, you know, carried away in the habit of doing something like that. So, um, that's really how Sherlock Holmes gets surprised, and this is the way that we should uh, look at uh, new situations, in a sense of anticipating that new situations are going to come up, situations are going to change, and then knowing that, being able to adapt quickly to it, and not be taken aback. So this leads me on to my next set of points. The adaptation of this skill to your personal and professional life. So, this is a very varied, wide, broad, and at the end of the day, useful in pretty much any field kind of skill. <laughs> it's the Swiss Army knife of mental skills. And not everyone is going to apply it in the same way. Sherlock Holmes is a criminal investigator. He is a detective. He uses the deductive, inductive, and abductive reasoning that we talk about on this channel. He uses mentalism to deduce things about not just people, but crimes. You know, using the reasoning backwards thought process to reason backwards a crime scene, to think about how criminals uh, act and how the criminal mind works and all these different things. Now, we're not all going to become criminal investigators. Not all of us want to do that. And, you know, not everyone... That's not for everyone. A lot of mentalists um, take their, uh, their skill and do performances with it. Ben Cardall, Darren Brown, they are performing mentalists. They show off their skill in, in a way. They demonstrate it. They, and it's really cool and entertaining to, to watch these, these uh, amazing mentalists do their thing. That's not for everyone. Not everyone wants to uh, be a, um, a stage performing mentalist. Now, when it comes to this skill, the people reading part is pretty much applicable to everyone. I find it's pretty much the most applicable and uh, practical use of this skill. But it is not the only way to use it. Reasoning backwards can apply to pretty much everything. So basically what I'm trying to say is that 
when it comes to deduction, figure out what your passions and interests are, what your career is, all that stuff, what you're interested in, and then see how you can apply deduction and that reasoning to that. Of course, you're going to interact with people, and of course, the people reading is, is a big part of that, but how can you apply that same thought process that you apply to people to the work that you do and the things that you're interested in and the things that you're passionate about? That's pretty much what I'm, what I'm trying to say, and everyone, it, everyone's going to do that in a slightly different way. Some of us are going to go, uh, go more towards the criminology route. Some of us are going to more, go more towards the stage reform route. Some people are going to go more towards whatever. And that's a good thing. Now, with that, once you've figured out how you want to apply uh, deduction to your, uh, your personal and professional life, then you have to study accordingly. Now, that is going to be next week's video.